dumpster yeah. fire and stuff. Um, we're doing three on one week off moving forward with dumpster fire to to because we had an offer for it. And then I got panicked and I was like, I do not want to do this every week. I don't want to be. It's the only thing that grounds me in the news cycle that I do. I can I can, you know, I can record four or five walk ins welcomes in advance. They can still all be pretty evergreen because I really try hard to keep them evergreen when I'm interviewing people and um obviously current events come up but as much as I can I try to keep it evergreen and I can stockpile them and check out for a month if I want I can't do that with dumpster fire which is much more grounded obviously in the news cycle and so it I'm grateful that I had that and then it was very dumpster fire-ish I was like how much time have you spent watching dumpster fire and they're like never mind we don't want it (laughs) Awesome. I like shot myself in the butt. I shouldn't have said anything, but I'm like, I, I was just like, are you sure you spent any time watching this? Um, and they're like, never mind, we don't want that anymore. I was like, well, I did, I can't say I blame you. Yep. Um, and that's good. I think, I think, it, but even sometimes, so as a, you know, as someone who's, uh, as a creator, I, I would say you have to constantly be asking you, you need to like know what Hills you're die on. Mm-hmm. You know, there are certain things where I'm like, boys and girls are different. I'm going to die on that hill. Yep. <laughs> Obviously gender is like, there's, there's a lot of sure. conversation we can have about gender stereotypes. There's that that's undeniably something that I think we've done a really good job picking over the bones of that carcass for the past 10 years. But I don't, I don't think that biology, like there, like you said, I think biology bats last now too. Yep. <laughs> like yep. no matter what you say, your cells are programmed um, to be one or the other with very, 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 very rare exceptions. Um, I was, so yeah, ask yourself like free speech too is another one. What What are the hills you'll die on and learn as much as you can about those hills that you will die on because you probably will die on them. <laughs> Um, and when faced with, you know, that everybody's kind of a brand, ask yourself, are you okay with this brand for at least two to five years? Mm. You know, I think you can always pivot once you get big enough because we've seen many people do that, but I would, whatever you're doing is going to stick with you and it's what you're going to have to talk about forever ad nauseum you know on every podcast you do when you're invited places so make sure that you have a diverse enough um, brand or at least that you are committed and passionate if you're if it's a single if you're kind of like a a, like like a an activist I guess sure that you have enough passion um, to to kind of understand that now you're going to be the girl that talks like if it's like you go out and you say I'm like here's my experience with my um god something traumatic that happened to you Mm. um and that you're kind of building a brand around monetizing your trauma like you are going to be reliving that over and over and over again and make sure that you understand that you know before before you're like want to before it takes a toll on your psyche because now you're just talking about that over yeah. and over again. I was thinking um, about Ian Hersey Ali and when you just said that and how obviously she's very different in terms of she's not some shallow person, but I it just brought to my mind that she has to talk about what she experienced all the time. But she won't. You know, she she like makes very clear boundaries around sure. what she will and won't talk about. You know, so I think that she has she's smart and that when she um when she she's smart and that when she's on a podcast that's massive like rogan she'll probably divulge more of those those details because the audience is so huge they might not be familiar with her but genuine generally with um smaller appearances i think she's pretty clear about you know like i've already talked about x so now we're talking about y 
yeah. or we're talking about the content of this um yeah she's very smart so she she's she's good at setting boundaries for herself and what she will talk about and that's another thing i would tell people is like there are boundaries and you can just say i don't want to talk about this i don't want to talk about that and the person who is interviewing you or you're podcasting with can either agree to that or not um and yeah then i think too like you said, focusing on quality rather than quantity as tempting as it is. I see a dip every week that I take off dumpster fire. For example, dumpster fire feeds a lot of our subscribers on the site. And every time I don't do a dumpster fire, I, I see that, you know, I, I see that monetarily and I have to be like, that's okay. (laughs) You know, like it's okay. We are building something and it's going to take, maybe it'll take longer. Um, but it's okay because I'm more concerned about the mental health of me and Maggie and Sam and all of us. And I also want to, I think if we want like be the content you want to see in the world. Mm. So if you want to, if you want to prioritize mental health, the mental health of you and your team, and you want to reject constantly having to churn out crap in order to make more money because you are being rewarded with likes and attention and money and subscribers, you've got to be willing to take that hit. And yep. it's hard. It is, and it's an intentional. You have to do it intentionally. Yeah, you have to be intentional about it and you have to you have to know why you're doing it so that you have those values as a company um, or as a brand or as an individual content creator so that you're making sure that you're taking care of yourself. And it's also an endurance thing. You know, this is, you will burn out if you're constantly churning that stuff out. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's just that you have to ask yourself, some people have that stamina and they, they want to do the daily thing and they, they love it. And it like jazzes them up and, and they see the money coming in and it re- they're rewarded and they, and I just am not built that way. And I want to, I want to put stuff out that I want to make sure that I'm enjoying what I'm doing. You know, yep. I don't want to just be doing something because it makes me money. That's not why I even built the life that I built for myself Mm. because it took me so long of like waiting tables and to get to the point where I do, I'm so grateful that I am in this position. I don't want anyone to think like I, I accidentally stumbled into a weird part of the culture wars that I never, if you would ask me driving out here at 20 years old when I was driving to LA, what I thought I'd be doing in no way, shape or form would it be this. But if you ask me when I started my company, I I mean, I was kind of doing the same thing, creating content, writing blogs, commenting on the world. That's really what comedians do. So I'm, I'm doing, there's nothing I'm, I would rather be doing. I'm living the life I wanted to build. Um, it's just making sure that I'm checking in with myself as, as it's growing and as um, I'm growing so that I'm not just being carried by money and algorithms yep. into a place where I'm like, how did I get here? You know. <laughs> like, Do you think the grind from comedy, from the comedy world, maybe helped prepare you for the grind of this or do you feel like you were already kind of doing that with what you said with blogging and your company and stuff before like I mean mean? I'm just I think I've always been grinding it's one thing I've learned as a business owner you can't teach the hustle it's like Mm. something I cannot teach people I can incentivize people I can motivate them with um, some things whether it's money or credit or um, the hope of something bigger in the future, but I can't, I can't, uh, teach people how to be a hustler, you know, like that, that drive is just in me and it's been in me. And it's the thing that there's no reason for me. I should have given up on fantasy. Like, 
God, the idea is 20 years old. I went bankrupt in 2008. I should have probably given up on that dream then. Mm. I should have given, and many times thereafter, I should have abandoned hope of anything. Um, I was waiting tables at 35 years old when I got sober. And I remember and have been reminded by people of when I was 36, 37, um, which is 37 is when I sold my first piece to Playboy. I was 37 years old. Wow. So, and now I'm 42. So all of this has been five years, but it is like 20 years in the making, you know, yeah. there's, but that, um, that internal drive is not something that I can teach people. So sure. I think that in any of these situations, when you're that, when you are that kind of creative engine and you have that know what your strengths are and then try and help have people kind of fill in the blanks to to um to tell you when to stop or rest to be more organized if you're disorganized you know you you just recognize that uh you're not going to be able to like be all the things yep yeah the creativity is like a weird thing with me in that I always equate it to like this, the mental image I get, and I know this is weird, but it's like a butterfly that just kind of shows up in my face mm -hmm. and like, and that's the idea, right? And I can either like engage with that right there in that moment, um, which is be like trying to sketch it and like gently kind of flush it out and try to explore it and understand it. Um, I can dismiss it and then later try to think about it, but I'm trying to go off of memory. So I'm going to make mistakes and it's not going to be as good as if I do it right there, or I can try to force that idea into something else I'm trying to do. And that's just like crushing the damn thing. Mm -hmm. And it's this weird thing where I have like ideas, like I have my wife, God bless her. Like she knows whenever I get something like I call it kind of just something stuck in my craw. I just, mm -hmm. I tunnel vision in on that thing. Like I, I found this notebook the other day. Or, uh, or as a folder that we were on the way out the door. This is like maybe two years ago. We were on the way out the door and I said, hold on, I have a, I, I thought really fast. Let me write this down on a post-it note. And I ended up with like 24 post-it notes that I put in sequence from just this train of thought that I had that I stuck on the table. And then later whenever we, and she just stood there by the door, it's like letting me do that for like 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then I put them in this, in this notebook and ended up being this interesting kind of, I was going back through it. I'm like, okay, first off, I can't really read my handwriting, which tells me how fast I was trying to go and get this out. Um, but it was an interesting thing, but like, I, I don't know how to channel that, you know, like sometimes it's that, and it's just, you're bombarded with ideas about stuff. Like I had one in the car the other day that I was like, I had to stop and take notes on my phone, you know? And then there's other times where it's just like radio silence. And then you have to go back and try and engage with some of the stuff that I thought of before that I never flushed out, you know, mm -hmm. but it's like mm -hmm. so inconsistent and it frustrates me. And that's where I get into those places where it's like, okay, if I don't have anything to say, or I don't know. And that's also like some of the demoralizing stuff too. Like I have this thing that I've been working on for about a year now that like has evolved so much over that time period. And that I, I think it has really good ideas in it. I think I really believe that. And, but now there, I'm at this place where it's like, okay, I think that this, these are the types of things that I think would actually help ease societal tensions if people were interested in doing that. Like it's this thing that basically addresses our expectations of institutions and how those are all fucked up. Like mm -hmm. our expectation of higher ed, our expectation of the government, our expectation of the media is way, it's not calibrated right to what those things are providing us. And so people are just frustrated all the time because they're not yeah. getting what they like subconsciously are expecting. But, and then, you know, I, I hit this point, I think it was around the election where I'd been working really hard on it and, and go, go, go. And then I'm like, wait a second, no one is actually interested in, in facts. No one's actually interested in trying to analyze these things. They just want to rip each other apart. So it's like, what's the point? A lot of these facts have been out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a lot there. I don't really what, know what I was trying to say there, but the, the creative process is a, is a struggle. Cause it's not just about trying to get the ideas out, but then it's like, does anyone give a shit? Is this even going to matter? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and fighting past that, it, it can be really difficult sometimes. Yeah. I think too, it can be demoralizing 
Um, when you're trying to, yeah, in in many ways, I feel like a a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. Like, mm-hmm. am I putting out something that society even gives a shit about or wants? Yep. Um, and I also have to come into acceptance with that too you know i think that there were so many years that i was writing for no one and no reason and uh, hilariously as we were talking about earlier was when i was probably the most delusional and i think (laughs) now that i'm like in the competitive market i'm like oh i need to get better there's so much room to grow um and my own self critique of my, and I'm aware of my place. You know, I had a, <laughs> I had this guy be like, Hey, if we close this deal, you're going to be the smallest deal that I close. I'm like, <laughs> yes, I, I know I'm not a big deal. Like, Thank you for the, telling me that <laughs> in the scheme. That's the thing is there's no there, there, and there, there, and there's always more, you know, there's always until you're like at Joe Rogan's level, there's nowhere else to go. And then where does he go? Like, I, it's gotta be hard even for people like him. hunting for weeks on end. That's where he goes. And it doesn't, yeah. he can do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, I, I don't think he's like upset, but I think that they're, they're, you know, there's, there's probably things that he wants to do. There's always yeah. more, there's always yeah. more striving. And how do you balance, um, how do you balance ambition and sanity? You know, like that, that, that striving constantly and balancing that with just being healthy and gratitude, really yeah. like that is, that is the tension. I think um, when I'm feeling demoralized or when I'm feeling like, what's the point of this or does anyone care or do I even care or what's it all for or any of the nihilistic thinking that can take over my, and in fact, my whole brain. Um, that's when I have to really come back into the moment and look around and be like, I built this, I made this. It has been something that I've, I, I have wanted to be, um, a creative forever since I was 19 and I'm, it took me many, many decades to get to this point of hard work and persistence and failure, a shit load of failure. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why I like look around at people with confidence and in their opinions and in their place. And they're like, I belong here. You know, like I'm just like the voice of reason. I'm like, how do you get like this? You know, that's like, a red what? flag to me, man. That's a red <laughs> flag to me. And if someone's confident in that stuff, I'm like, I just I don't, don't trust you. I don't know. It's just a very strange. I, I've always looked at people with confidence like they're science fiction characters, you yeah. know, like, where did you? And it's funny, even some of it, I think, is just genetic. I think that I have I'm pre wired to be um, my mom always used to be like, why are you so deep? You're such a deep thinker. It's going to be life is going to be so hard for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mom. What the hell? <laughs> And my other sister is like so freaking confident and was honestly born that way. She just was like, I'm like, here I am. And she's You're confident welcome. In her choices. Yeah, very <laughs> much. And confident in her choices and is very much like, get on board or get out of the way. Like you're <laughs> either with me or you're my sworn enemy or you're just dead to me. And she was like that when she was four. I'm the oldest. I remember her being just, I remember looking at her being like, how does this child have such a deep sense of self? And I feel perpetually confused. And I think there's always a, a part of me that feels a little bit lost, you know, even still. That's called um, humility. You want to keep that. I don't know. It just, I, I don't think it is truly like the more I learn the less I know. I just don't, I don't know how anyone can be certain of anything in this reality that we're in right now. And I, I really do have to 
it's hard because you've got to go, go like macro to micro, you know, mm-hmm. I think I have to, I can pull out and that's what happens when I start doom scrolling is you're just pulled out in the macro and you're like, everything is shit. Everything is yep. shit. Everyone is shit. And then you look around and you have this great life and you're neglecting that great life and all of the amazingness for all of these things that are ultimately like, what power do I have over any of those things? Yep. Gas short it currently, whatever the list of things is. Um, I, t- I tell I tell the story that about how I once. Well, you're talking about the the doom scrolling and the macro, the micro. I always think of Wally and how everyone has that screen in front of their faces or on that spaceship in the movie Wally. But um, I was once on. I uh, did some contract work a couple of years ago, and the guy I worked with was a good guy, but he was very much a conspiracy theorist, unapologetically so. And I was stuck on this roof with him, you know. Missouri it's like 100 degrees I'm sweating I'm hot and he's just going on about this you know cabal that runs the world now these like 12 people and finally I was like dude look okay a couple things one my life is pretty good honestly so they're not doing a bad job so I'm okay with them <laughs> like yeah I'm, I'm glad it's this group of same 12 people running the world than the ones who are doing it in like 1940 so yeah. so I'm okay with that. And then I'm like, secondly, let's say it's true and they are as evil as you say they are. We're two idiots on a roof in Missouri. Yeah. But she was like, what are we going to do about it, man? Like, this is like so far out of the realm of anything we can do where it's just like, you just got to live your life. Unless you, re- like, that's one of those things that if you, be- if you really believe that, you either go all in on it or you just don't you know yeah. and it's like you got like you can't there's no middle ground where it's like it doesn't do anything to tell me that there's this this dozen people ruling over the other billions of us right and it's yeah like, what can you do about it you just got to focus on what you can actually control you know and i think the problem with social media is that it's given people an outsized perspective of their place in the world oh yeah um when really like it's the same story it's always been. There's a couple of people, you know, there's the people at the top of the pyramid yep. who have most of the money and wealth and power. And then there's the masses. And even with a microphone and a podcast, like I'm still one of the masses, oh, yeah. you know, and maybe a little bit be. farther up, like maybe the middle of the pyramid, but I'm still like the 99, you know, I'm, I'm not deluding myself into thinking that, I'm in the same pod as like Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yep. yeah. And that seems like all of human history. I, I don't know that we can escape the the pyramid scheme. No. no. That is <laughs> that should that should be the name of your your this episode. Humanity is a pyramid scheme. Humanity is a pyramid scheme. Uh, you're not wrong. It's it, like yeah. it is. And I, and I think that you just that's why it, I you know forget that none of this matters it really that was always like the the original fantasy philosophy I had like 11 points and number one was you're going to die and the last there was a bunch of other stuff in between and the last one was none of this matters but all of it does like none of this really matters what it does matter to the people in my life it matters to my dog my husband my family can I be a good sister wife can a daughter, um, aunt, neighbor, it matters to my friend down the street who's, you know, a Holocaust survivor. Like mm-hmm. I can do things and bring them cookies and those things matter in this moment. Um, what I'm doing helps people, hopefully makes them laugh, hopefully gives them some insight, maybe, maybe gives them uh, hope that they can do their own thing and also resilience just if I like a dumbass like me can kind of pull myself up literally more than once um, many times uh, I would say most people can <laughs> and yeah. anyone really can and well, what's know, the collect- I- what's what's the collective effect of that right like your shirt says politically homeless will work for change, you know, right? And that goes to the to the point of where you said where none of it matters, 
but also all of it matters. And so it's like, if everyone adopts that, not to get so Jordan Peterson or is the guy who talks like Kermit, as you mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> but like, if, if we all collectively embrace that, like that whole political homeless thing is it's like, okay, so there's this growing group of people where we have to at least believe that it matters if we do something right. Like yeah. you can't live like it doesn't matter because that's, that's death, man. That's suicide. And so we have to at least act as if, you know, have you ever watched that movie, uh, Boiler Room, you know, no. with uh, Ben Affleck and uh, Giovanni Ribisi. It's a good movie. Uh, it's it's an older one, but it's a good movie. And what they're they're doing like trading stuff. It's like uh, uh, selling selling stocks. Um, and Ben Affleck is like their coach. And he, his whole thing is like, act as if like when you're talking to those people, you have to act as if you got to make it real act as if. And so it feels like we have to at least act as if it matters. Because in a way, we can manifest that by by doing it. Oh I mean, yeah, the way that's you did like that. fake it till you make it. Right. The whole idea. Yeah. This is very also in recovery. It's like just act as if you're sober or your thinking is sober. It and, um, but in a weird way, I think the action people need to take is is to like detach from the parties completely and disidentify you know, I don't even know if that's a word but to, to basically I don't think that it's um like I'm not looking for a home really nope. mm. um I'm comfortable with my my politically my political homelessness there's no uh, I want to work for change with everyone, you know, yep. from all I would like to bridge um, the gaps between people who refuse to talk so that maybe we can actually make some progress instead of like all this fake rhetoric that yep. people just continue generating in order to keep their jobs as pundits and politicians. Their own and I power. think the yeah, I think the growing group of people are the people who there was a great thing that um the the pandemic ushered a lot of distrust and even the whatever remaining institutions people might have had trust in yep and there's this growing group of people i think who it it's disorienting you know i think when all of the major institutions around you are are collapsing can't be trusted you see through the veil of the illusion it is a little bit like waking up in the matrix or whatever. And, and you're like, wow, I can see all of this for the, the facade that it is. And being able to be comfortable in that space of not knowing, you know, mm -hmm. just not knowing what we're building, just knowing that the important things that we have to maintain are the ability to have conversations with people we don't agree with, you know, <laughs> that's yep. pretty important to the fabric of society <laughs> and being able to unplug, I think is going to be increasingly more and more necessary for people's mental well-being. I was on Twitter last night and I was like, oh, my God, everyone is losing it. And if everyone that I'm observing is losing it on here, I'm probably losing it too. <laughs> and just can't and don't know it. Meta. <laughs> There's no yeah. reason for me to think that I'm outside of this process. Sure. You know, I'm I'm very online. I'm engaged. I scroll. Like there's no reason for me to believe that I'm somehow better than all the other Above people the fray. losing their minds online. I, uh, and I said this in a piece, you know, I Trump is breaking everyone's brain. And I'm like, I think I had to come to the awareness that he broke mine, too. Mm -hmm. And if I'm looking around at everyone saying everyone's losing their mind, I think that's a clear indication that I am, too. And really, how do I put guardrails around that? We're more and more. We're going to have to figure that out for ourselves, how to put guardrails around, because it seems like we're all driving ourselves crazy. Yep. Well, at the same time, this is what sucks about it is it's like, yeah, like we, we are at least living in this like proxy reality with Twitter. And again, I, I because of where I live, 
I see the dichotomy between here and the major metropolitan areas so starkly because I go back and forth between them. And it is, mm-hmm. so I know, I mean, I know you took that trip where you're traveling around maybe last fall or something and you were like in Arizona and stuff. You talked about it on Phetasy. And it's just like, they, these are so different. These realities <laughs> yeah, are so different. So and it's like the, we do need to disengage. We do have to like take a breath and try to understand this shit. But as we're doing it, the people who, like you said, are at the top of that pyramid, they're going to keep going. They're going to keep making decisions. Like there are real world things like those vaccine passports, like the teaching CRT in school and, sh- and shit like right. that. It's like, so it's like, we can't fully disengage, no. but because that is so all encompassing, like the culture, like no one is just engaged in that one thing, whatever the one thing is they're worried about, it pulls you in and you will get drive yourself crazy, even if you're trying to disengage and only handle the one thing. So it's like, there's that tension between, I got to get outside. I got to you know just walk around and explore and not be part of this madness. But at the same time, there are laws being passed. There are companies doing these things. I might be working at this place. It's wanting to do this stuff. And it's like, hold on, wait a second. You know, that's harmful. Or I, my kids are at school and they're waiting this to happen. But then I would say fight those battles locally. Totally. And I think yep. this is where people do need to, if you're going to engage and it is like, think globally, act locally, what yep. you can affect change in those arenas locally. Yep. Um, on the local get, I try and run for school board. You know, if you care about what's happening at your, your school at your kids, public schools, run to be on the school board so that you can actually affect change or run like my mom always used to say you can't fight city hall unless you're a part of it you know be this is where i think take some notes from the squad like they they agree with them or disagree they're good at recognizing that you can't affect change unless you are part of the system in some way or another and you can't even really change the system unless you're a part of the system you can try from the outside but that's why I think you see people just descending into violence and anarchy yep. and chaos. Um, yeah, I, I do think that there's, but again, you have to just, that's where it's a, a time thing and pick one thing, you know, don't, yep. you can't your like, battles. yeah, it can't be um, like, you can't be like, I care about CRT in schools and homelessness in my neighborhood. You've got to just like figure out, a, pick a lane that you want to try and affect change and try and put most of your effort into that one lane. Otherwise, you'll spread too thin and you really won't do anything. Although I, this is coming from me who has like 10 million projects, but um, I'm not trying to really change anything. Right. I really just want to be a gathering point. You know, yeah. I would like to be just a, a lightning rod or, or, a like, a like I say, I have like a politically homeless shelter. I would like it to oh, be a place where like, like people that. can all come. They know they're not alone. They know that there's a space that's pretty safe and they can be themselves hopefully and disagree politely with one another and work out some of their thoughts and views and and bounce things off safely and out outside of them the public eye where they'll get attacked um and that's really that's what i like to do is be like a tent for people but in terms of what to do with that energy, I mean, this is why this is what I was talking to Justin Amash about. I just kept kind of hammering on him. I'm like, okay, well, what do we do with this energy? Yep. <laughs> like, how do we do we all just join the Libertarian Party just so the Libertarian Party has like, do we all just register as Libertarians, even if even if we're not really Libertarians, just to identify together as one? You, like, I mean, it's. I, the thing I like about the Libertarian Party is that it does have a pretty nice spectrum. Like, yep. even one of the things that we were talking about is that in the Libertarian Party, it's 50-50 on pro-choice. And, you, you know, like, that that's crazy to me. That seems like, oh, okay, you probably could have a pretty nuanced conversation about this within yep. this party. Or it would, like, destroy the whole party. But, um, yeah. 
I think that that's actually promising. That's how sure. most of the parties should look is like. Well, and they used to. Yeah. As or as recent as three decades ago, they used to. I mean, there were Democrats that were pro uh, or pro life, uh, pro life. And there yep. were Republicans that were pro choice and on, on guns and all this other stuff. I mean, it really yep. didn't change until early 2000s is when you start yeah. to see that stuff. You can go on um, that opensecrets.org and look at funding that the NRA gave and that Planned Parenthood gave to candidates. And you see it go from, of course, it was a majority Republican or majority Democrat, but it goes to like zero, you know, for both of them yeah, around yeah. the mid, mid 2000s. And so it's like, it wasn't that long ago that we knew how to like have a robust variety, Balance. like heterodox views and stuff. We knew how to do it. And then something happened. I think the internet is a big part of it. Yeah. That made it to where we, you know, got some kind of a cultural amnesia and just forgot that it wasn't that long ago where we could talk about race in a way that wasn't this crazy shit. Like where we understood that men and women were biologically different, but also people deserved respect and dignity if they didn't fall into our, you know, normal categories that we see as a society. Like we understood this not that long ago. And then we just, we forgot it. Like mm -hmm. it was like a, the men in black thing, you know what yep. I mean? Yeah. Hopefully we can remember it. Hopefully. Okay. So, um, so I, I know that we're, we're a little over on time. So I have three questions for you. Okay. Sort of rapid fire a little bit. Um, black pill or white pill? Where, what do you mean? Where so, am I? Yeah. Do you feel like you're more black pill or white pill? I had a conversation with a girl the other day and I said, I feel like I'm overlapped in, in the middle. And she said, well, then that's a penguin pill. And I said, okay, I'm penguin pilled then. But, uh, but right. Um, but where do you, I feel like this changes on, on any given day for anyone. And a lot of it has to do with how much time they spent on Twitter that day. But, uh, <laughs> but do you feel like you're more black pilled or, or, or white pilled? Um, I feel white pilled about it. it it's actually white pilled about my life, black pilled about society. So I'm optimistic and feel good and grateful and loving and open and creative and like mu very much in the flow. And if I never went online and had no idea what was going on in the world, I would just be like, -la -la, everything's amazing. Um, and then when I go online, like you said, I'm like, Oh shit. Um, everything's not amazing, but I think the problem it's like, how much of this is a self-fulfilling prophecy? <laughs> how much of it is just everybody being online being like, everything's getting worse? Well, yeah, it's going to get worse if collectively we're all just online screaming that over and over again. And this is where I think just disengaging is is the only way. And um, putting more content that's more optimistic, this is something we want to start doing, more like white pill content into the world. And, you know, to even balance, like Dumpster Fire has, a, I think, a pretty good dose of a white pill even at the end we try to get to it if we start out like everything is shit but i'd like to put just some more standalone white pill content into the world and um because i i do still think things are still better than they've ever been before yep. which is a very weird paradox of the time that we're living in a, a lot of the stuff that i'm seeing like i remember the the Middle East was on the news pretty much every night when I was growing up. It was it was always in the news. It was yep. just part of my upbringing. Was there was always something going on in the Middle East, and and it was always not good. And I think Jonah Goldberg had a tweet yesterday where he was saying I, none of the cable news shows at the ten o'clock hour had any coverage of what was going on in the middle east which is crazy that yep. was like the that would be like the lead story pretty much in in my upbringing so um and not feeling like you have to say anything about anything you know just know when not to say anything uh is a big part of maintaining the white pill because sometimes there's just so much input you're like i it you you know, when you're saying like, I hate everyone, that is a red flag that you are being blackpilled probably by too much time online. 
and to get offline. There's just like, know what the triggers are to take care of yourself. And, um, but I'm not even sure most people are that aware. I think everybody just kind of scrolls and like goes, does what they have to do when they have to do it. And we're just very new at all of this. You know, we are like in a, like little guinea pigs. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like you. I think that I'm, um, I would say gray pilled. <laughs> I don't know. That might be why I feel so flat. Maybe. <laughs> it's yeah. Like the compacting, like Those I feel enough. good. And I also feel if you see trends, you're like, ooh, this shit's about to go off the rails. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Dude. Sorry, go on. No, pessimistic. I, I feel black pill. You know, everybody that I interviewed, it's funny. I interviewed Justin Amash and Jonathan Haidt, and they're all coming out in the in the co- next couple months but they all said the same thing they both said the same thing which is everything's gonna get worse before it gets better so that seems to be among the the like people way smarter than me what their opinion of the trend is but i'm um the question for me is like okay well how long are things gonna get worse you know like, what's our capacity like, for damage dead? yeah yeah, yeah. Like any, any thing can sustain only so much damage before it's like, it's dead. It's gone where it's ir- irrecoverable. And the idea, like another way of saying things will get worse before they get better, which I do believe, I, I think that as well, um, is another way is saying we have to sustain more damage as a society, as a culture, as a country, um, as individuals before things get better. And my question is just like, okay, but like how much more wiggle room do we have? Like what's our threshold to where whenever the things get better is, you know, a flower sprouting out of a rubble pile. You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, and so I don't know. And that feels like, and that's where I go, okay, am I black pilled or am I just reading the room, man? Like, you know, I don't, I don't know. And we're just so lucky. We're so totally. lucky in America. We're yes. just so lucky. I was thinking about this yesterday. I was reading one, another one of the millions of articles that I've read about Syria, feeling helpless and just thinking about what, you know, they've been through as a country and as a people and how they've just been completely screwed over by the global community and, uh, no one cares like they're just it just feels uh so sad and then there's this like yellow bird outside my window in my amazing place and I feel extraordinarily grateful and it's just luck like all of it's luck all of it so much like maybe you made your circumstances right now though I obviously you're born in America that's luck you were born born in Syria yeah yeah Yeah. that just that's just luck I was born in there were bad things that happened, but I still, I still had an upper, you know, the, the, this is why I hate the idea of like privilege that's been so destroyed because now it's become this, this cudgel that everybody used. So people are like, well, I wasn't privileged. And it, it inverts everything where it's not a bad thing to recognize that you were lucky. And there was that amazing monopoly study that they did with humans where they, basically gave people um extra money extra turns and then had them play a game of monopoly and without fail the people with extra money and extra turns took credit for their win and attributed it to decisions that they made in even though they were they started off with more and they had more opportunity and they were they had like bowls of pretzels and jelly beans and they observed like the people who were winning and had more opportunity and money they were just more cavalier about taking <laughs> I mean it affects your sure. whole mentality yeah they were they took freely from the bowl of pretzel it's, it's like this crazy study and we're all I think victim of that mentality and I try very hard to remember like the um, 90 the only reason that I'm alive as an addict is luck the mm-hmm. only reason I don't have a DUI is luck. It's not anything other than luck because I know people who aren't even alcoholics who have gotten DUIs just because they got drunk one night and got pulled over. Um, I drove drunk. The only reason that I didn't kill someone driving drunk is luck. There's 
so much of it is Sam Harris talks a lot about this and I appreciate it. It's like that moral luck. You know, we all judge the person who like runs a kid over when they're looking at their phone. And how many times do we do that? Yep. It's just, um, I, I try to remember that. And I think Twitter and those places, I was really looking, thinking about this yesterday, just like, wow, this place really just brings out the worst in all of us. Yep. You know, we myself included picture myself included again. I'm not outside of this. That picture of that couple loading gasoline. Um, we are just conditioned to like judge and label and make, and then it's incentivized by retweets and all of the worst of this stuff. Not, not being like, wow, this couple must be in a lot of fear. I hope that what, what can we do to like help people with their levels of fear? This is the, it's the mass debate too. When people are like, all oh, these people with their masks on, I'm like, they're afraid. Yep. I put my mask up when I walk by people who have masks on, not because I've been brainwashed by society, but because I'm just courteous and I care about the other person because I know that they're probably terrified because they've been terrified by a media. And uh, yes, there's a whole conversation we can have about that terror and where it came from. But in that moment, I'm trying to alleviate their fear. And we just don't like, we're not being trained to do that. We're being trained to that it's tribalism. It really is like, this is where Jonah Goldberg's work and writing is so, has been so instructive. It's something that we somehow by some miracle managed to overcome in our humanity and we are descending back into it. And I see it even in, in myself, although I'm not even in a tribe, but those instincts of like that, I think tribalism that the, um, the just like, everyone sucks feeling is yep. feels very tribal well and you you can you might not have you don't have to know your what your tribe is or even say you don't have one to know who isn't your tribe right like to say i don't know what i am but i'm definitely not you like i'm definitely not that guy yeah yeah, yeah screw you i mean that's this like and that's what's bad is that yeah. i feel that being activated in me almost constantly and i and i hate myself for it i hate myself when i'm in that place you know just i really yesterday was like i seriously need to just deactivate my twitter even though it would like hurt me monetarily it would hurt me financially i just might need to like deactivate it for a while for just for my own I freaking hate everybody and I hate myself. You know, yep. it feels like an addiction. It feels very like this is not good and it's not good for society. I'm part of the problem. Well, I think there is something to the people that, yes, we are all part of the problem. I agree. We feed the beast and we feed it to ourselves and then we blame others. And, but it's like, okay, I, you know, that's that, that episode of South Park, right? Where they find the heart of Walmart when Walmart comes. You remember this one? <laughs> Yeah. And they find the heart of Walmart and they want to destroy it. And it's a mirror. And it's like, <laughs> you fucking built me. You yeah. are my power, you know? And so then yeah. they burn the Walmart down and, and they're like, they we're all going to go to to Greg's like pharmacy. And it, and it, and then it goes, goes. And then they, then the end of the episode is, you know, whatever Greg's pharmacy is the same size as Walmart. And then yeah. they're standing outside of it, having burnt it down too. Like we all create that thing and it's a cycle that's difficult to know how to break out of without just like completely disengaging from the society but for someone who is like this is the thing that pays your bills you know finding that balance is really difficult I think that Dave has a like where Dave goes off the grid once a month you know for the every year like that's got to be such a lifeline you know what I mean for and going engaging in that I used to do it for um Lent I would go off for all of Lent and I didn't the, this past year because it's just so hard I and mm-hmm. mostly because if I have guests on my show particularly guests that maybe don't have as big of a following as I do it feels shitty to not be able to promote them and and be like go follow this person it's you know it's like part of the agreement but they're not agreement but it's part of the it's part of, yeah, the understanding and it feels like the right thing to do also just not to, yeah, that's like why they want to come on and it just, um, 
Yeah. So that balance is, is very challenging. And even as um, a writer trying to get a book deal, for example, that platform is all they really care about. They're like, how can you market yourself? Whose podcast can you go on? That's really all that matters in publishing. They're not going to do any marketing for you. You're going to basically have to market this book on your own. And so having those platforms also matters. It's like saying no to some of these, um, these, you know, granted, I'll probably end up doing them, but I, I just needed to take a step back and not do anything. And we were trying to figure out if we were moving, like it was too chaotic. There were too many moving parts, but even that it's like my friends who are PR people are like, you're an idiot. You need to do that. You need, need these relationships. If you ever sell a book, you have to go on. And yet I'm like, do I want any other? You know, that's when it's like, ah, be careful. It is truly like, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. The only thing um, worse in, in life than not getting what you want is getting it. Yeah. That, it's that Chinese curse. Like, yeah. may you get what you want. <laughs> yeah. Get it good and hard. Um, okay. So, so that's the black pill, white pill question. The other question I had. Um, so like fast forward a year from now, you can change mm-hmm. one thing tangibly. It could be in your life. It could be in America, but it has to be tangible. It can't be like people are nice, something like that. What's one tangible thing that you would, if you could look to this day in 2022, that you could measure and say, okay, yeah, I would rather this be this instead of this green instead of blue. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I would rather, I, I want to finish my book and it sounds so selfish and limited, but it is one thing I can control. It's a massive block in my life. And I think I'll feel better if any book, I don't care if I freaking like just rewrite my journals or whatever, <laughs> transcribe my journals into a book, anything. I, I think if I could finish that and sell it and have that, it would um, free up a lot of space in my mind, but it seems to be this, this hurdle that I cannot overcome in my own it's like that book. Um, have you ever read? Um, oh God, it's like right there. The War of Art. Mm-mm. Who wrote Not it? Not the Art of War. The War of Art. <laughs> yeah, Stephen sorry. Pressfield. Okay. Um, who's written tons of like historical fiction? He's just a beast. But he wrote this very small book that you could read in a day, and it's all about just being. And then he wrote Turning Pro, and all about basically overcoming that resistance and like he says the project you feel the most resistance to is probably the one that's the most important for you to do. And it will be the hardest and you'll meet the most resistance. And that is undeniably for me a book. So there's like all kinds of um, self-worth belief, confidence, because I'm like, who the fuck wants to read? Like who, who, why do it doesn't matter though. I want to write a book. Like I should have written six by now. And that resistance I think being able to overcome that resistance will be that will be the most tangible thing I can do to change my life from where it is sitting here today okay cool that's good I wrote it down I put 5 12 2021 you're gonna have a book written by 5 12 2022 um okay so my my last question is and this is maybe based on just your experience maybe writing for playboy or anything like that um is so we were given our, our daughter's almost two she'll be two in less than a month and we we're giving her a bath uh, a couple weeks ago and she stood up in the bath and she leaned down and was pinching her nipples so hard that I became physically sick and my <laughs> wife's like looking away and I go are you seeing this she goes yeah she's been doing that I can't watch because it hurts me and I, I was like okay and then a, a few days later you know, I'm tickling her and like pretending to like bite her, like, you know, and, and she puts her foot up in my mouth and she's like toes. And she wanted me to put her toes in my mouth. And my wife said, she's been doing that also. So my question is, should I be worried? That my, I would have be worried. <laughs> that my, my two-year-old daughter pinches her nipples harder than I could sustain as a, as an adult man. And it's just like totally That's cool. With it. Just like a kid thing. They okay. do all kinds of weird shit when they're discovering their bodies. It's I like, guess. <laughs> it's like they're, they're, it's like they, you know, they're, they're becoming aware of their like, um, autonomy and their, their, 
their body. Like they they do all kinds of weird things. Have you ever seen that Louis C.K. routine where he talks about his daughter and she's like on the ground and she's she's there's he does a really funny. Which one's it routine. from? <sighs> I want to say Shameless. I feel like that might be the the one it's from. I'm not I've sure. seen all of his specials and I. Don't remember the exact joke, but I know what you're talking because his bits yeah, are so where great. He, how he she's drags like it lying out, lying on the ground and like t- she's like ah, just like a maniac. I think yep. that I think kids are like they get little boys do too. They're always playing with their ding dongs and like <laughs> I think kids are just freaking weird at that age. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. And then they become weird at adults that get on Twitter and shit post all day. Yes, but yeah. That I, w- I wouldn't I wouldn't be concerned. I think okay. it's just the normal kid shit. That, that's what I thought, but I, I, I just wanted to run it by someone who might have at least run I mean, I'm that. not an expert, but... Well, uh, yeah. Um, I, I think it's pretty normal kid shit, and I think the, like, more worried and neurotic people get about things like that, the more it, like turns their kids into weirdos well and they make it true you know and they make it yeah then they're like oh what's that you know it's like ah whatever you're just a kid like go as long as you're not doing that in in church or hanging out with your grandparents you know standing up and pinching your nipples then it's probably (laughs) fine okay well uh, this has been a lot of fun bridget um you know having me yeah i mean i know we went over on time so sorry about that um no worries so if you could tell people where they would, you know, find you, find all of your hilarious Twitter for now, interesting. Twitter for now, really, honestly, go to go to locals and just you can follow all of us and you don't have to. It's like Twitter in that way. You don't have yep. to subscribe. So I would say that's probably the most the place I would want people to find me more than anything, because who knows how long I am for Twitter. I definitely feel the light and I've done it a couple of times of. Um, deleting all my posts and just <laughs> shutting down. I've done nice. this twice in my Twitter Twitter life. Like one of them was fairly recently, wasn't it? Mm, Twenty eighteen. Okay, was the last time I'm I was awesome. like, I'm out of here. Um, so yeah, I definitely feel that instinct coming, and I can't, I can't delete everything because in the event that I do write a book, one of the chapters will have to be about Twitter because it really did create me. And so it gave me wings. So I can't delete it. But if I deactivate it, maybe then I can just like shut it down for a year. Shut it down. That's how that's the brain right now. It's like, shut it down, shut it all down. Uh, And then you can find me on Twitter for now and on Instagram at Bridget Fetacy. You can find me on Locals. You can find me on YouTube at Fetacy. Um, am I forgetting any? I have a column at Spectator. I have a Substack now. Oh, cool. I didn't know you had yeah. a Substack. Oh, uh, wait, no, yeah. Did you start that in the last month or two, maybe? Yeah, I just yeah. started it. I have all these letters that people wrote me over the course of the past years from the politically homeless. And they're mm. fascinating. I and wrote I, you one. I wrote you one. I think after one. I of need things. to publish it. Can I publish yours? Yeah, you can. I, it was either you wrote one, or you had people write you after the a, a debate, or after, yeah, after the, the election. debate. Yeah, and that was one. That was the one that I that I wrote you. I wrote a piece about that called "The Art of Exhaustion" after that debate, mm. and it was just all about how exhausting the the whole thing is and how it just makes me want to check out if I remember. Yeah. I like your, I, I should spend more time with your stuff because I really like it. You wrote something in my community that I read that was really well-written and thoughtful and insightful in the state of the world and nation. I think um, you have good instincts and insight into what's, uh, into the things, all the things. Well, thank you. Um, well, I appreciate that. And so everyone, if you're not part of Bridget's, especially her locals, um, you know, I would say go follow her on Twitter if you're part of that. But if you don't have a Twitter account, don't start one just to do that. Um, it's cancer. Uh, but it is. so go join the locals. The fantasy community is fantastic. It's it such is, a double-edged sword. It's the best one. It really is. Um, and the handle is also a sword. Uh, as you're <laughs> uh, and for me you can follow me at uh, return to reason uh, on youtube on twitter it's at my mundane mind on locals return to reason.locals.com i post stuff on medium 
and on ThinkSpot occasionally as well. I think I might be doing something on ThinkSpot next week. I don't know. I need to figure that out probably. Um, huh. But but that's it. Uh, I'm going to stop recording and then we can chat for a second um, before I let you go. But uh, thanks everyone for watching and tuning in. Bridget, thank you so much for doing this. Seriously, this is like the coolest thing ever. I really appreciated it. Um, so yeah, anyway. Thank you for having me. It was yeah. really Peace. a pleasure.